Welcome to the Agents of Innovation podcast, where we feature conversations with entrepreneurs, philanthropists, and artists. Hello and welcome back to the Agents of Innovation podcast. I am your host, Francisco Gonzalez, and I'm here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida at Kaiser University, and I'm here with Dr. Art Kaiser, who is the founder and chancellor of Kaiser University. Dr. Kaiser, welcome to the Agents of Innovation podcast. Well, glad to be here. Honored. Well, thank you for welcoming me to Kaiser University. Um, I know you all were founded in 1977, and today you have grown to more than 21 campuses in Florida, and also you have some campuses in China and Nicaragua. Nicaragua. So we're going to get into that in a little bit. But, um, you know, you, I really want to introduce you to our audience a little bit more, uh, because in addition to starting Kaiser University 45 years ago, um, you've been recognized by the South Florida Business Journal as the ultimate CEO and 2019 Power 250 leader, um, also by Florida Trend Magazine as a Florida 500 living legend, and you earned the prestigious International Academy of Business and Economics Award for your support of business research in the acad- academic community. So here I am, and here we are in the Agents of Innovation podcast, sitting next to a Florida living legend. So thanks for being here. What a a, a distinguish for for us on our podcast. I'm the one who's honored. (laughs) Well, thank you. So Kaiser University, in its 45th year of existence, um, you have had an annual economic impact, annual economic impact of $3 billion, resulting in approximately 30,000 direct and indirect Florida jobs. Um, but what's so interesting about this story is you began with just one student and two employees, um, and you've since offered more than 100 doctoral, master's, bachelor's, and associate degrees, um, nearly 20,000 students currently, and 66,000 alumni, alumni, plus you employ over 3,800 people in this endeavor. So a lot of times people see a successful person, and they see what's going on right now, but we're good. Let's go back to 1977. What what was the uh, the genesis of why you started Kaiser University, and and then um, how you how you opened it with one student? Well, that was a post Vietnam era, and I was in a graduate program, a doctoral program at the University of Florida, and that was there were no jobs for historians, and my mom was working at another institution here in South Florida. And we uh, were up in New York City at my sister's uh, apartment, and we were talking about what are we going to do. So we sat down and said, why can't we do what, what her boss did and then open a school and build a better mousetrap and uh, start an institution? We didn't know what we were doing. You were not correct. We had five employees but one student. I was able. I was the recruiter. My mom was the teacher in the medical field, and we had a. I had a, a, a secretary who worked for, with my mom at the other school, and she knew more than I did, and she never forgot to tell me that. <laughs> and we had a, a little a typing part time typing teacher, and this little bitty that you know right out of the movies, gray hair, you know, perfectly coiffed and trying to teach typing, and I had a. a dental assisting instructor who the students called her a 300 pound uh, Dorothy Hamill <laughs> and so two weeks before uh, we were opening we took my mom's alimony to start the school I was out there recruiting students and I didn't know what I was doing but we had one student with her uh, father came in 18 year old uh, I won't tell her name but Terry and she was, you know, very young, very, uh, I was the only student I was able to recruit. We started school. She comes in about an hour late and says, Mrs. Kaiser, Mrs. Kaiser, I hope you don't mind. I hope the rest of the class doesn't mind I'm late. And she looks down and says, well, you are the class. You are the school. And We've been waiting for you. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, it was uh, truly, uh, we, you know, I've always had a belief that you become a student of what you do. And over the years, I've become a student, and we grew. We survived because I was able to write some grants uh, in those days for CEDO. We didn't know what accreditation was. I didn't know what you know financial aid was. 
we we you know we really started them from scratch. In fact, I was just at a, uh, a state board meeting up in the Wyndham in Orlando. In 1979, I was up there at a co- conference, uh, kind of a workshop for small schools. Because at that time, the VA, we, we, we applied to get VA approval. And the VA came in and said, show us two years of continuous attendance for uh, your school. And I couldn't do it. I mean, something as simple as that. So at that meeting where I was there yesterday, the same place, uh, this woman who was then an a important part of the sector, she shows me how to do it. I said, wow, that was simple. <laughs> and, and I learned at that time what I did not know, which was pretty much everything. That's great. Well, you know, some might have given, given up early on, you know, just, uh, you know, one student coming in the door. Uh, by the way, uh, let me ask you something else. You, you did a, was it a history degree at University of Florida? Yeah, I was studying Latin American history. I study Latin American history. Uh, at, at, uh, I started, uh, really, uh, I graduated from FAU and then did a master's in history at Maryland and almost went on to the PhD. But, you know, um, something else I, I want to bring up here is, you know, uh, with you, the structure that you started this, what was it like when you first started it? I mean, like you just said, you weren't maybe necessarily thinking. I, I assume you had just had a passion for, for, for wanting to instill some, some education. What was the genesis? And can you tell me, like, what makes Kaiser stand out? Yeah, I, I, I worked for the, I worked for, as a TA for uh, the head of the history department. And this gentleman would come in every day smiling and say, this would be a great job if it wasn't for the students. <laughs> And that was not atypical of the state university system or faculty members. And, you know, it was so frustrating because I really wanted to teach. That was, uh, that was my passion, and that's what I really wanted to do. I was lucky before, after I graduated, I got some job, uh, experience in sales and taught me a lot about that. But I was, you know, that's why I, I was the recruiter. I was the admissions person. I was the bursar, the manager, the everything my mom taught. But the the key was I had a passion for education. I had a passion for students. And uh, it was really frustrating. Again, one, not knowing I was ever going to get a job teaching in, in history. And because all the Vietnam folks before, um, you know, I was about, I was the first year of lottery for the draft. Wow. So all the kids before, which my peers, but a year or two older, they uh, they all went in and kept staying in school so they could keep the, get their draft deferment. Mm. I, I you know I had to compete with all those people before me and and there were no jobs so this was an opportunity. Uh, I, you know I, I I am entrepreneurial. I believe in in uh, you know my skills in trying to build a business. I think it was misplaced. I didn't know much then. But at the same time, it was exciting for me, and uh, uh, we, we took the risk. And again, it was my mom's alimony that was our stake. Yeah, so when, uh, when you said there were no jobs, were you talking about in the, in the career field that you were going in? Or yeah, in, in higher ed. In, in higher ed. ed. Yeah. Because, if, again, the post-Vietnam period, there were a lot of people stayed in college, got their doctorates, and they were working. I was looking at the opportunities to work, and they were just not there. So, so Kaiser University, uh, really, it's a, it's a, it's interesting because you have 21 campuses in Florida. Is that right? Um, and all but one campus um, is, you know, it's mostly all working adults, right? So you have the the fairly new campus in West Palm Beach that is a most is a little bit more like a traditional university where kids are coming out of high school and going there, and you've got sports teams and, and all sorts of things. But most of them are working adults. Um, has it always been that way since you started? And uh, what what is that? Um, why did you create that structure to, for people to, in those career fields? Well, that was our niche. Uh, again, it's what we call career education. And, and my first student was an 18 year old, just right out of high school. But the niche is people who have, um, you know, looking to improve themselves, looking to improve their job opportunities, to provide for their families. And that's the design that we used to start the school. Uh, the adult learner, uh, and in our case, 68% of our students have been to a community college or a state university before. 
and I graduate with an English degree or a Latin American history degree, <laughs> and it is not that marketable. So what we uh, are, uh, the model that we used and the model that we uh, that was effective for us was to uh, identify those students who are looking for a career upgrade, and we designed the program around them rather than most traditional schools design it around the faculty or the, uh, the institution, which meant we taught one class at a time. And that was probably the most important attribute of our schools that we still do, that an adult learner who has uh, 82% of our students work part-time, 68%, uh, I said, have been to another university and either have failed or have not completed. 64% of our students have dependents. 48% of our students have spouses. So these are very challenged individuals who have very specific needs. And the model that we designed it with one class at a time. So in other words, instead of taking four or five classes as you would at a traditional university, the last week you used to what, they had a cram week where you'd study for your test. If a student is working for me, I'm not going to let them off for a week just so they can cram for their final. So these are students who, you know, again, they had to have a fixed schedule. They had to know what courses they would take. They don't have six years to finish four. They don't have four years to finish two. They want to get it over with, and they, they know what their schedule is from day one. It's focused to the career field. There are not many electives except what's required by the different agencies that are recognizing it. And it means that our students are successful. U.S. News and World Report last year ranked us number one in the entire country for providing students social mobility, which is our mission. And when I say number one, that's out of 450 major universities. And one of my favorite is uh, our neighbor down the street, FIU, advertises their number five. And I always look at it and say, yeah, we're number one. <laughs> so and, number one in providing students with social mobility. mobility that's, right. that's fantastic. That should be the goal of higher ed. It's, the, it's certainly what our mission has always been. And our mission, the accrediting commissions make them a little more complicated than they need to be, but it was clearly, and it has been from day one, provide quality career education to motivated students. And that's what we do, and that's what we're good at. So you talked, you mentioned something there in earlier in that conversation there where you said, uh, uh, you talked about the completion rate. So what does, what does a completion rate say about an educational institution, and how does yours compare? We compare very uh, the last data I saw, we were like, if we were ranked in, to the state universities, we would be number two, and ranked with the other independent institutions in Florida, we'd also be number two. And the reason is, again, it, it, st students have a lot of challenges when they're going to school, and it's hard. Uh, you know, you read about all the mental health issues with students today, but it, it is a challenge, especially our students, which have responsibilities that the typical student at Gainesville or uh, Tallahassee and Florida State would not have. And so we have to, one, keep them motivated. So that we got to have a faculty that, one, understands the field that they're teaching in, and two, can keep the student's interest. Three, a structured education, which they feel, you know, I'm being pushed, and at the same time, uh, the structure allows them to be able to complete it. So if a student doesn't complete, it's it's a not a great investment. If the students can complete, can enter to the workforce and start working in the field that they want, that higher ed becomes a very good investment. So, yeah, so because there's a lot of questions right now with higher ed, right? Um, there's a lot of people asking if it's worth going, especially right out of high school and not only, you know, part of the worth going is what are you actually learning? How does it apply to an actual job that you might get, an actual career path you might have? But also the amount of student uh, loans that is saddling so much. Uh, I mean, it's, it's the biggest, I believe, uh, factor now in, in debt in our country in terms of personal debt that people are carrying. Um, That's a little way overstated, but okay. I can get into that. So, so <laughs> but, but with that, where does Kaiser kind of separate itself uh, or see itself in, in the scope of higher ed? Well, first of all, there's a lot of misinformation out there. A lot of it is activists who, who are looking to create a free, you know, a free education community like they do in China. 
and like they do in Russia, you know, where you go to college, but you have to, you're told what college you can go to. We have some great freedoms in the country, and certain colleges are good for people, and others are not. So, you 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 know, there's a big advantage of choice in higher education, but the whole issue of student loan, it is the best investment that a student can make in my mind, because you know. Uh, the big loan debts that you read about, those are the law students, those are the medical students. They're not the undergraduate students because truly they're limited in how much they can borrow by law. So it's not in the baccalaureate degrees or the associate degrees where these loan debts are so significant. But think about it. If you were to go out to buy a car, a Camaro, you're going to pay $40,000 for a Camaro. You're going to borrow 80%. And five years later, there's no value. If you go to school, you borrow the money, and that's about maybe that's even high, much higher than our average debt. But you graduate, you get a career, you can increase your value to both you and your family. It, it, it doesn't stop. It's increasing in value. So – the, the student loan debt crisis that people talk about is really in the minds of those folks who want to create a singular public education system, which is free, like a free community colleges. Tennessee did that, and their enrollments are down like 20%. So I, I, know, I hear from a lot of young people, uh, f- folks younger than me and, and folks coming right out of, out of college now, it seems like there was a, an idea that higher ed would get them a career that would pay them well. And a lot of them are seeing a lot of challenges with uh, the kinds of jobs that they can get. Maybe it's related to what they majored in. Maybe it's related to what they did or did not spend time doing outside the classroom uh, while they were in college. But uh, there, I mean, I hear it from a lot of young people. They just, they're, the expectation level of what they thought that degree was going to get them is just not there. But so what I'm asking as well is I think that's a blanket for a lot of higher education um, where the the career path, the, the, the connection to the career path, to the actual job that they're going to get day one coming out of school, uh, there's a big gap. This is the misconception that getting the four-year degree isn't actually that direct um, uh, opportunity for a job. Now, in certain fields like nursing or uh, even what you, pre-law, you have to go to graduate school. Mm-hmm. You know, what college does for folks, and it's not we're, – we're more career-oriented, but even at a liberal arts institution, it teaches people intellectual discipline. It teaches structure and learning. And it's the learning that is important, not necessarily the job afterwards. Because you can be the best student and get a lousy job. You can be the worst student and get a great job. The key here is learning and how to learn. And uh, college is still a very important part of our society, if nothing else, that prepares people for higher education and for, uh, for, for higher learning skills. And, and it, it's also what, what drives me crazy is they say it's too expensive. Well, if, you send your, if you're a wealthy person, they send their children to private schools, K through 12. The K through 12 where my granddaughter is going to go in pre-kindergarten or is it kindergarten? I don't know if it's one of those two. <laughs> Cost ten thousand dollars more a year than what we charge for a college education. Thirty-two thousand, thirty-three thousand dollars. There's no financial aid. There are no loans, and that's what wealthy people do because they recognize that the key to success is learning, your ability to learn, and they give by going to a, a you know a private school. That makes that person more successful. Now, if you study English at Harvard or Yale or Princeton, that doesn't mean you're going to get a good job. But it means you're going to get a really good education that helps you learn to think, reason. And that's recognized, whether it be an investment firm or going into grad school. Uh, I shouldn't talk about my – well, I know of someone who went to Princeton for four years – 
very talented young man, interested in, in writing and dance and arts. And he's out of school now three, four years, trying to get a job as a screenwriter in Hollywood. And he's not making a whole lot of money. Yeah. And he's just trying to get an entryway. Graduate of Princeton, number one school in the country. Uh, at least it's recognized as the number one institution. Is he any less intelligent? No. Is he any less intellectually prepared? No. Will he be successful ultimately? I believe he will. But again, being that he went to Princeton doesn't guarantee that he gets a job. Right. That's a good point. Um, so Kaiser, you know, one of the things that stands out for me is, um, and this is l learning this recently as well, is you have t with the 21 campuses around Florida, um, and you can maybe elaborate on this because it's this just my little bit of understanding, uh, in each of the local communities, it seems like there's a connection to the kinds of um, classes and courses and I don't know if you would say majors uh, that people are studying in connection with the kinds of jobs that industry in that area needs. Exactly. And so um, that to me seems like right now, especially with the economy the way it is, and there's a lot of, um, so I just talked about people having a tough time finding a job, but employers are also having a tough time finding the right people for the openings that they do have. So how is Kaiser kind of helping to fill that gap? Yeah, each of our campuses have advisory committees. We have well over 1,000 individuals who are part of our advisory process. And each campus has a separate advisory camp, uh, group that sits and analyzes what, whether it be in Lakeland or in Newport Ritchie or Jacksonville, all different. Like Jacksonville is a huge uh, port. It has, it's a significant uh, entryway for um, goods and services from around the world. So logistics is a big issue. Jacksonville has a big program, both in a bachelor's and master's degree in logistics. Now, Lakeland does not have that. Uh, Naples does not have that. So Naples, again, having serious uh, retirees, numbers of retirees, large medical complexes. So there we do the doctoral program in nurse anesthetists. We do a nurse practitioner. We do uh, programs that would meet that particular need in that community. That's so great. That, that's what we I was on do. your Orlando campus two weeks ago. Okay. Our, our friend, um, well, your, your uh, employee, oh, I guess, Br Brittany yeah, Parks, uh, gave me a tour. So thank you, Brittany, um, for that. And um, one of the things I noticed, and she pointed out, there were different kinds of, you know, obviously we were going into different classrooms. Um, there was a lab, you know, where they were, they were, um, so, but all of the students were, they had, they were all in uniform and these are working adults, right? So they're all on campus in uniform and they were each in different uniforms, depending on the kind of career path they were on. What is the significance behind the uniform and the distinguishing by the types of careers? Well, this begins in day one for us back in 1977. We believe higher education is a structured process that the students need not only an intellectual discipline, but the personal discipline in their fields. Now, if you're not in a, a uniform, which would be like in a medical field, you're going to be wearing a tie, a men, or a professional dress as a woman. Now, if I went to college and came to Kaiser University and I said, I mean, I, I, I wore shorts, cutoffs, and going to undergrad, and it was a whole different world. For our students, it is about the discipline and structure because, one, they're adults for the most part. Now, we don't have that at the flagship, which is our 18-year-old group, but on all of our adult campuses – the need for structure is so critical because they're not getting it in the K through 12 system. They are not getting it in the uh, in many cases in the workplace. So, in order to be a nurse, in order to be a uh, occupational therapist, you have to have the discipline and structure for that field, and we that we not only encourage it but we expect it. Uh, it's the same thing with entrance requirements. Every one of our programs has a different requirement based upon the intellectual and the uh, educational background that that program needs. So that's why we have high pass rates on the national boards, and that's why we get recognized by U.S. News and World Report for number one in social uh, media. Yeah, and I think I saw here um, also 
best colleges in America, one of the best colleges in America by value by Money Magazine. So that's great. Hits on some of that. Um, I I think these are some statistics I have right. So correct me if I'm wrong. Um, that on your campus, only about 10% or so come right directly from high school. And it seems like that's mostly. It's, I think it's a little higher than that, but. Okay. Uh, now, flagship is is the whole thing. is the inverted. It's like eighty twenty. Uh, we'll have twenty percent come from high schools in the. And that's in West Palm Beach. In West Palm Beach. Yeah, we have a hundred acre campus, and it's uh, with residential halls. And as you said, we have sports, which have been very successful. The uh, Seahawks right behind us here. The right? Seahawks. <laughs> in fact, our, our we have right now two uh, both men and women golf are. Both fighting for national championships. Wow. They won? Lacrosse. Well, lacrosse, men's lacrosse won. Wow. One of the interesting things is Kaiser University in the last five years have won more national championships than any other institution in the country. Stanford is number two, and Texas is number three. Well, you're not competing at Stanford on the field. No, right? we're not. We're, we're small <laughs> so, school stuff, but yeah. it's still an achievement. That's a very uh, good achievement. It, it shows how effective our coaches are. And we also have received, and, and we won the Learfield Cup two years ago, which is there are three Learfield Cups given, one for Division One NCAA, one for Division Two NCAA, and NAIA, which is we are. And that means the most outstanding performance on the field as well as the most outstanding performance for as student athletes in the classroom. That's great. Um, I also note that you have a high percentage of women. We, we are, yeah. The yeah. flagship is more balanced, but uh, in terms of our t- most of our classes, uh, most of our campuses are primarily female. That's great, and and about twenty percent or so are are veterans. Twenty percent veterans. Uh, we are a Hispanic serving institution. Thirty four percent of our students are Hispanic. Twenty four percent are African American, and thirty five or thirty six percent are typically uh, white students. So we have a very diverse student body. Okay, uh, so um, what, you know, uh, what structure have you found in setting up this institution? I don't know if it's for-profit, non-profit, or if it's been uh, different times, different seasons. What have you found in the structure of setting up the institution that's been most effective? Um, we were originally for-profit. The reason we were for-profit, we didn't know any better. <laughs> We went to the state licensing board. Uh, I drove up from Gainesville to meet with the state licensing board, and they said, you have to form a corporation. So we formed a corporation. Uh, and we were a nonprofit. Um, though we, we tried, actually beginning in the 80s, uh, we, we set up a nonprofit organization. And, but it took us till 2010 to actually make that transition. And so we've been nonprofit since 2010 till today, 13 years. And is it was it, is it better to be nonprofit? I mean, is it uh, what 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 would it, let, let's just say if someone was getting started or if someone was just like looking at the system from the outside and seeing all these different types of you know colleges they could choose from um, or just be a part of what what is what is the advantage of being nonprofit? Well, this might be controversial. I don't see the difference. Okay. Um, if you are a student-centered organization like we are, and we were, it, it, the key is the quality of education and the, ca- the caring of the students. Now, you can be a nonprofit organization or a public institution, and uh, as I said about my professor, it's a great job if it wasn't yeah. for the students. Or you can have, and you know, when I taught one of the classes, I had 400 students in my history class. I was a TA, you know, I was a Latin Americanist teaching American history. You know, it's, I'm not sure the quality of education was there. Where at our institution, all of our classes are small. Uh, Our maximum class is 25. We get to 26, we divide it in half because the key is the interaction between faculty and student. That was no different when we were for-profit versus non-profit. So I think that distinction is way overblown, again, by the critics and that are trying to focus everybody to public education. But in in our structure, again, is one which is student first. It is our culture. It's all about culture. Uh, if your culture is good, the school will be good. 
And in our case, our focus is on the student. We make decisions that are for the best for the student, sometimes more costly, sometimes uh, uh, not as efficient as could be. But our job is to prepare the student for uh, the skills. It's like the dress code. There are students who say to us, I'm not coming to your school because of a dress code. You know, but, you know, that could be, if you look at it from a, a business perspective, that's not necessarily the best way to, to deal with it. But from our perspective, providing that student the structure will make them more effective in the field. I mean, I can't tell you how many students come to work, you know, come to school and never tied a tie before. Mm. Now, if you go on a job interview, you should be wearing a tie. I don't care yeah. who you are. I don't care what your job is. You come in, you're dressed well, you're, you're organized. That's going to make a difference in, in whether you get hired or not. might not be the only reason. The key for us is the, the, our focus is on the student. And we have the motto, student first. So now we don't have tenure. We don't have, you know, the key is uh, that the teachers push the students as far as they can get without driving them away. It's, it's kind of, you know, the student is always, is it not our customer? Because I can tell you the student is not always right. The customer is always right. The student is our client. Much like if they were going to a law firm and the law firm says you should do this lawsuit, you don't do it. You don't pursue it. Our job is to be honest with the students. Our job is to push the students. Our job is to give the students structure and discipline. And if we do that, we're successful. And if we don't do that, then we're not going to be successful. And it has nothing to do with the corporate structure. And what about the educators here, the instructors? Uh, what kind of credentials do they need to have? Now, we're accredited by the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools. That's our institutional creditor. And we have 29 programmatic accreditors and almost 100 different grants of accreditation. And each one of these agencies have specific requirements. So we have the same requirements that uh, Florida has, uh, Harvard or Yale. All of our teachers at uh, baccalaureate level or graduate, most of them have PhDs. And, it, you know... But we add an additional requirement, and we want workforce experience. And they have to have at least five years of workforce experience in order to be uh, a faculty member for us. Well, it seems like you really are preparing students for that workforce. Um, you know, going back to the dress code, I was thinking about it. You know, it seems t to some people maybe well, a lot of, uh, you know, institutions of higher education don't necessarily have a dress code. I don't want to come to yours. But every business environment has a dress code. <laughs> Correct. Or most. I mean, unless you work for, you know, uh, Google. Twitter or something. Yeah. You know, they're, uh, whatever well, they're doing. But What was but, it? Twitter had the wine dispensers in their cafeteria. I said, wow, that's a job. I'm, uh, you know, I'd probably get uh, but for the liver most disease. Part, right? Most of the types of jobs that people are coming yes. here for, um, they're going to have a dress code when they leave here. So, like you said, it be good to maybe wear a tie and uh, prepare for an interview. Right. Um, the other uh, thing is um, you have campuses in Nicaragua and I think two in China. Uh, tell me how long have you had them, what goes on there, and why? One in China, two in Nicaragua. So we got a little backwards. Oh, I got it backwards. Okay. Uh, well, Nicaragua is closer, so it's good to have two there. <laughs> we've been in China since 98. We've been through a, you know, a number of different campuses. Uh, partly one uh, in 2001, we had a campus with the uh, Beijing University, which is one of their preeminent. We had a workforce two-year program out in the suburbs of Beijing. But then 9-11 happened. It was a, a two plus one between coming here and so all the visas disappeared. Mm. So that one, uh, we get back to Beijing. We're currently uh, working with the uh, uh, Shanghai uh, College of Foreign Languages and Industry, and we have a campus on their campus, and that's now eight years old there, and we teach uh, computers, tech, data analysis, and things like that. Nicaragua is a different story. Um, we were we took over a campus from Ave Maria University that oh, was yeah. there. Uh, that campus was founded in 
89 by the uh, University of Mobile. Ave Maria bought it 10 years later, and then Ave Maria did not want it. They were going to close it, and one of my close friends was uh, involved with that campus, and in fact, the library is named after him and his family, and he brought us in, and we took it over, and it's been a, uh, just a delight. We added the Managua campus, and uh, it's growing very nicely, and uh, it's a strange environment. The Ortegas are uh, making some real big changes there, but we we are kind of recognized as the elite institution in, in Nicaragua. Wow. And how many students go there, approximately? <sighs> We have a little under a thousand students at both campuses, and we have a big language school, uh, which has about five thousand ESL students in in Nicaragua. As in well. Nicaragua, oh, that's great. Well, that's that's really something because those are the only campuses that you have outside of Florida, right? Other than yeah, for yeah. Kaiser University, we have another school that we work with as campuses in uh, North Carolina and South Carolina. Oh, wonderful. Um, well, one of the things I like to ask people on this since we talk to a lot of entrepreneurs and innovators and like to see, like I always say, you know, somebody's journey began a long time ago. Um, what was your first job in life? It could have been something you did as a kid. I was a nursing assistant. You were a, a nursing assistant? Really? And uh, My father's a doctor, and uh, he at 16 was one first job I could have because I had to get paid. Uh, I got one training at Memorial Hospital in Hollywood, and... Uh, became a nursing assistant and worked every summer and every Christmas and all the way through college. So can it, can it, do you think a 16 year old today could, could do that? Could be a nursing assistant yeah. today? Is that, I mean, it's a training program. Is it that, was a training program at Memorial hospital. Yeah. That's right. Now what is your, what's the biggest takeaway or th- that you, you gained from, from that job that maybe it stick, sticks with you today? Uh, you got to be on time. The, I remember the, you know, we clocked in, which uh, you had the clock in 15 minutes early. I remember that. And, uh, uh, you know, it's a tough job. It's a very hard job. And, you know, the patients are very demanding or they're very sick. And um, uh, it, it was a, a great experience. Uh, yeah. And for me, you know, being able to get make some money during the summer and make some money Christmas, I, I love because I get double time or triple time, especially on Christmas Day. Mm. So I didn't mind. I wanted to work. So in your uh, now 45 years running Kaiser University and everything you've been involved with, um, you know, you've, you've worked with a lot of other educational institutions, uh, a lot of these educational accrediting agencies and, and lots of lots of you know, get your hands in uh, Nicaragua and China. You've been, you've been around now a little bit. What do you think has been your most uh, the thing that, that you have impacted the most personally on education and education policy? That's an interesting question. <sighs> yeah, we ask a lot of interesting questions. I'm, I'm trying to... Uh, <laughs> no, I know that's a tough one. We have a staying power. Uh, you know, the for-profit sector has been under tremendous fire. And I'm passionate about it. I believe in it. We still have Kaiser, Southeastern College as part of our group. And that is for-profit. And... I've studied history of education in, in the United States. And my, my predecessor was a man named Ben Franklin. <laughs> ben Franklin in 1741 started a small school called the Franklin Academy, which he needed printers. And he was a printer. And he needed to train printers. And kind of an apprenticeship, but he, he created this little school, which is today the University of Pennsylvania. And we don't realize how many of the major institutions in this country were started by either a family or by individuals. And it is that entrepreneurship that has really made higher education today. And in many cases, higher ed has forgotten all about that. Um, and, and, you know, we, we've been fighting. I've been fighting this battle for 20 years, and I've – angered some people and made a lot of alliances it's uh, it's been interesting and we've i've been playing at a on a national level and uh at a state level and uh but i still believe in the passion of individuals in higher ed and we lose that sometimes uh in 1939 uh general hap arnold was the head of the army air corps and the army air corps was a 
it's kind of a throwaway for the U.S. Army. And they didn't have any budget. And he, he saw what was happening in Germany and Poland. And he didn't know how to get money. He didn't know how to get people trained because he needed pilots. So he went to a friend of his who he flew in World War I who had a private flight school in California and said, can you help me? And he got 11 private family-owned flight schools around the country to work with him. And he said to him, well, I don't have any money to pay you. Will you do it? I'll get the money next year. They all said yes. They also did it with aviation mechanic schools. There were, there was at, uh, seven or eight of those. And I, and, I, and I look at this country and I say, that family, if it wasn't for them, we could have been in a, I could be speaking German today. I don't know if, I think it might overstate the case, but the fact is we play a high role. We, you know, up until uh, the community colleges didn't get started until the 50s, public education really didn't grow. Higher ed was the, was for the elites, not for the average person, not for the, the working class person. And it's changed. And I believe that our sector, the, the private sector, and even more importantly, the for-profit sector has served a critical critical role. And I think if my impact is is just being an advocate and a supporter of that, and I've served on licensing boards, I've served on two of those, I've served as chairman of the National Advisory Committee, which is the committee that oversees accreditation in this country. And I have been consistent in my belief that education is not just one form. It can be public, which is great. It can be private, independent, which is great. It can be private for profit, which is great. It can be in any way as long as the students are protected. Yeah, and I love what you talked about with the example of Ben Franklin going back where he he needed to train people to print, all right, in the printing industry because that was one of his biggest, you know, that was one of his um, companies that he had. And then that ended up leading to what you mentioned uh, University of Pennsylvania, which is now an Ivy League institution, right? So um, so a couple of things to go through. First of all, what is it? would it be like for someone today to start um, uh, some kind of inst- educational institution outside of the traditional higher ed? Um, and, you know, I, again, I just, I think this is really interesting in terms of if you go back to the Ben Franklin example and also what you're doing with Kaiser University, in that you're filling a need in the marketplace uh, where, you know, employers uh, are in need of certain kinds of, of skills. And right now we have a real deficit in the country in like people going into the skilled trades. I don't know um, if you, if Kaiser, I, actually I do know, because I think even at your more traditional university up there in West Palm, I heard you have an automotive uh program right? yeah but it's not mechanics it's, okay. it's uh, managerial manage you know we work with a lot of the dealers and train their kids oh okay but still that's a great response to industry uh that's, that's but that's different from what i was saying in terms of the skill trade i don't know if, if you guys have any of that i uh, get into that but what would it be like uh for someone to help on that on that start i had this discussion yesterday um it's a it's an argument and i was at the licensing board in florida there are, are people don't realize how many schools there are in florida there are over 900 licensed schools in florida wow most of, of them are higher not, ed uh, post secondary post secondary yeah, okay. the commission on independent education license these schools and you see very small schools very uh, people who want to start a school they can, and that's the beauty of what I did. When I went before that board 40-some years ago, I was nervous as can be, and I didn't know. And, and, and I could tell you stories about that all day long. But the same thing happened just yesterday. And, in fact, the meeting's going on today for the non-degree schools. So you can start a school. It's expensive. It's hard. The regulations have gotten just burdensome as can be. But it, it, it you will find entrepreneurs – People who, let's say, are nurses and they want to teach nursing. We had a lot of those schools that they're going to become much more regulated this next uh, after this legislative session we just had. Uh, there are people who are auto mechanics who start an auto mechanic school, um, but that's expensive. And uh, can it be done? Yes. Uh, is it more complicated than it was when I did it? Yeah. 
That's great. Well, um, you also, your wife works here. Uh, when did she get involved and what does she do? What's her role, um, Belinda? She's head of our uh, student services area and government relations department. And she started about three, four years after we got married, in about 86, 87. And she's very active. As, right. as we talked about earlier, uh, she's one of those people that the Energizer Bunny. Yeah, I, I had a chance to meet her. Um, I don't know five or ten years ago, and we have a mutual friend, Karen Hoffman. The other who one was on. Um, I think she was on episode ninety-eight or something okay. of this podcast, ninety-nine. I can't remember. Yeah, um, they both uh, serve on the. I think the commission on status of women and yeah, a whole lot of different commissions. So. Yeah, two uh, two amazing women, um, and um, so. Uh, I think you've just you've done a really amazing job here uh, with with Kaiser University. So I have two last questions for you, Dr. Kaiser. Um, what's an educational or even entrepreneurial insight that you can offer to uh, to a high school student uh, right now who might be listening uh, and or an entrepreneur? Well, a friend of mine, in fact, I think he wrote a book and he called it the Edrepreneur. So we are entrepreneurs, uh, people who start a school or people who uh, buy a school and, and run it. They're entrepreneurs, but they're also educators. Uh, so for a student who, uh, a high school student today, they need to be, they need to be thinking about the future. It, it, it's, you know, you said it's expensive. It is. There's no question. Uh, so you need to be, you know, a lot of students go to the college because that's where their friends go. That's not the good reason to make an educational decision. Or maybe their parents went, or they like the sports it's, team, or yeah. It, I think the third is probably more important, or where they can party. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, traditional four-year institutions. The amenities that the school has. That's to right. Offer. How right. how pretty the dorms are and stuff like that. Those are reasons, but not necessarily the best reasons because. Four years of your life is still a very significant time span, and it can either help you or hurt you. And my my and again, I see so many of the students who have gone to traditional education have not completed. I call it like putting notches on their belt. And what my goal in life is is to not add to those notches. So students need to think about what is you know what is it they're trying to accomplish. Now there's nothing wrong with a liberal arts education. I'm a product. You're a product. That is, it, it is important. Some students don't have the resources or the time. So you have to balance that. And um, both are important. But the student has to make the best decision for themselves and what they want to do. Now, there is absolutely nothing wrong with becoming an auto mechanic or an HVAC technician or an AI engineer. I mean, there are so many opportunities, but, you know, you got to do what you like. If you don't do what you like, you're not going to uh, stick with it. So identify the schools that are most, important, you know, focused for you. And uh, for our case, when you're finished the community college and it didn't work for you, you come to us. Yeah. We're, the, we're the college finishing school. Right. And, you know, you've, you, I think Kaiser University and, and what you've done to create here is, really helping a lot of people achieve, uh, you know, their slice of the American dream. Um, and, you know, uh, I wanted to ask you on, on that note, what, what will it take for our country uh, to ensure that uh, our citizens and residents that live here, um, you know, can achieve the American dream? Another good question. Um, I am concerned with government overreach. Uh, I do believe... Um, Public education is not for everyone. It is for some. It's, you know, for many. But there are choices. The students need to make good choices, good decisions. And if you make that decision, the American dream is available to you. Um, you want to be a nurse. You want to be a doctor. You want to be a lawyer, which I, of course, don't think anybody should be lawyers. <laughs> but that's, another, that's just a personal problem I have. But the fact is, it's available to you. Uh, there is funding, there are scholarships, there are foundations that contribute. It's just a matter of, one, developing the intellectual discipline, developing the focus, and making a good decision. 
Great. Well, this has been uh, really wonderful, and I just want to say thank you for your time. Uh, thanks for all you've done for the people of Florida and for our country um, with everything you're doing with the, the tens of thousands of students that are coming here and going into meaningful careers for themselves and their families. Um, and just thank you for being an agent of innovation and, and for being on the Agent of Innovation podcast. Well, thank you. And uh, I, I would love to see more people innovating in higher ed because we can be stale. We don't need to do that. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Kaiser. Thank you. Thank you.